So John, tell me, what is the greatest Nintendo system of all time? Or a video game system of all time, if you want to be, if you want to be broader. Well, we've ne we've never discussed this ever. Definitely not five minutes before we went live here. But it's absolutely the GameCube. It is. It is the best. Now I don't know how much of this is like truly nostalgia. Do you really think it's it's really nostalgia? How much the GameCube is like so cool and so like good in terms of the library, just everything about it, the controller, the design, just how the games looked, how the game sounded, all of it. It just it just feels. It, it's just my favorite Nintendo system, but I'm I'm kind of like figuring out like, do you think it's nostalgia or do you think it's actually like really that that good if it's really that up there? I think there is. I mean, there's nostalgia definitely because if you compare it to games now, visually speaking, it's it's nowhere near them. But I think there was just this this charm about Nintendo at that time in the early 2000s with their first party games, even some of the third party stuff that just felt. Very much Nintendo, I guess is the only way you can describe it. So you still have games that just there's nothing like them still to this day. So it's an easy generation for me anyway to go back to because it's not like the the chunky 3D visuals that we had when we were first moving to 3D with the N64 and the PS1. So they're they're tolerable and. The GameCube puts out some, I think, some pretty good visuals through an HDMI adapter with that digital port on the back to where it's it's still good enough. But I will say, if you can get a CRT TV, and I know you hear this from people a lot, like, a, like get a CRT. The GameCube at that time actually looks, it comes through pretty good on one of those still. I think it holds up the best. I mean, like next to the Xbox, like... Uh, hi like whenever i play the ps2 these days like it's just it's it's rough that that thing does not output necessarily very well yeah even through dirty old composite or something it still looks pretty okay for composite this game system still looks pretty good today 3d models and all of that you know obviously outdated you know it, it doesn't hold up in every way but i think from like an aesthetic point of view from an art design point of view most of the games i think still look quite good um you look at something like mario sunshine even like wind waker specifically wind waker is like the best looking game from that generation i'd say today that art style though helps a lot with that because at that time the ps2 and the xbox they were trying to cater to a more mature audience and because of that they tried to go more realistic at a time when we just we weren't quite there yet we got much closer with the 360 and the ps3 and then i think we're basically there now where you can have games that I mean, are as close to cinema in theater, in the movie theater experiences as, as we are, you know, at all. So at that time, I think Nintendo did a good job going with the, those art styles that, yeah, lent more into like the cartoony style 80%, 90% of the time. But something like Wind Waker still looks great now. You could fire it up and you're like, oh, wow, this this works. All right. Yeah, I, I, I think there's very little that really needed to be updated. It, it's wild to think like that was the game that they initially were like, hey, let's do an HD remaster of this back on uh, Wii U because like out of all the Zelda titles, it probably needed it the least, but it looked the best when it brought into HD without very little like effort put into it. And they still put a lot of effort into that HD remaster. But like when you when you look back at the original GameCube one, you, it, it's it's easy to forget how good that original game still looked. And, you know, Wind Waker may be an outlier just because of the art style, but, you know, games like Mario Sunshine, Metroid Prime, I think games back then, they, they just understood 3D visuals and they understood how to uh, get the most out of, like, art design and all of that to the point where, yeah, these games are still in 4x3, they may be a little blocky in various cases and have lower, uh, lower end textures, but, like, they still look, like, they, they're, they're never unplayable, they always look... Like, they, they have their own style, and I think the GameCube just holds up tremendously well today. But back in the day, uh, you know, how was the GameCube as, as, a, as a player back then? Because I, I had the GameCube as, as a very young kid. That was, like, my first game console. So while I understood a lot of its shortcomings back then, I didn't really understand, like, 
a lot of the really massive ones. I understood it couldn't play DVDs, but I kind of looked at it like, what are you saying the third party support is bad? Like, it's just like, I'm getting all these games and they were all like, whatever, the licensed kids games, pretty much, uh, because that's what yeah. I was playing back then. But as somebody who was uh, a bit older back then, uh, how do you, um, you know, how do you remember it back in the day as as a video game player? It, it was definitely not seen as as mature as the ps2 or the xbox and it it did miss the when you mentioned the third party stuff it missed some fairly large games like grand theft auto wasn't there that was that was probably the biggest one where you're like oh well the playstation has it and the xbox eventually got it and the gamecube doesn't have it oh well that's there's a reason for that in their mind is because the gamecube isn't really catering to the same audience but i actually thought one of the bigger titles that they missed out on was Final Fantasy X because that came out relatively earlier in the PS2's life and that was there are a few games I think back on that really made you feel like you were going into the next generation and that was that was probably the one like when you got Final Fantasy X and you fired it up and they hit you with that initial cutscene with Titus and, and about to play Blitzball and then it transitioned not seamlessly, but close enough to where you're like, okay, these in-game models still look really good. Uh, that was kind of the moment to me that kicked things off. Um, but the GameCube was seen as the younger system. And I, that was the system I first had back then. I didn't own a PS2. My cousin did, and I'd play it at their place. And we went over there quite a bit. Uh, but the GameCube was my first, like, this is my system from this generation. And all my friends had PS2 and Xbox. And I was the GameCube kid. Uh, but even then, as like 12 or 13, it wasn't necessarily a system you had a lot of people to talk to about it because no one, I think I was the only one of my group of friends that had it at first. And then one of my other friends got it. Um, so I would sit there and talk about some of these games like a Mario Sunshine. But the only one that really, I think, got people's interest was probably Metroid Prime because that was the other game that I was thinking of that made me feel like the GameCube, you could just walk up to people and say, have you seen this game? This game looks incredible. It's Metroid Prime. And it legitimately looked better than, I think, anything, even Halo, the original Halo. I, Metroid Prime had some moments, especially with weather and environments and them playing around with the visor that would fog up or, or freeze a little bit. Uh, and it was so fluid that that was the game that I think put the GameCube a bit over some of those systems at that time in terms of visuals. But it was... It was certainly not a system you ran around talking to everyone about. It wasn't until later, and really five or six, maybe even seven years ago, when all of a sudden the GameCube started to spike in popularity. And I think that's just because we, we all got older and we're now looking back on getting our childhood systems. Well, you can't you can't play a lot of these games anywhere else. Still, most of these games like that you really do remember from the GameCube, and and are these system defining titles are still only available on GameCube. A lot of the Nintendo stuff, but a lot of the third party stuff as well. And uh, even multi-platform stuff still like the GameCube, uh, I, I don't know, I'd say like on GameCube, a lot of those games, even if like, let's say the Xbox or PS2 version uh, has exclusive features or, you know, the Xbox version probably would run better. Um, I just feel like the origin, the GameCube is still like the most accessible to just plug in, play right away, no issue, just immediately the controller, I, I love it, you know. Uh, yeah, I just always preferred playing a lot of those games on that system, um, but it, there, there wasn't a ton of those games. Uh, there, it, it always felt like a lot of series would try like one or two entries on GameCube and then kind of give up or they, they try like a random one in the middle like like the Burnout games you know you got one two and then after that yep. none of them after after the yep. Burnout series actually got really good and, and really popular that's when they were like ah oh, yeah no Burnout 3 uh, and uh, nothing after that um, we only got and we got an exclusive Metal Gear Solid it was a remake but yep. still you Twin know snakes. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, no Metal Gear Solid 2, no Metal Gear Solid 3. Uh, do you know of any, like, reason why that? Why they they went for, like, a remake of the first game rather than, like, 2 or 3? Was it because of hardware limitations? Because of, like, the disc size? Or, or because Nintendo commissioned or, like, went to Konami about this? I don't think it was any real technical limitations. I, I think with... Because it was, uh, oh, so Silicon Knights did it? Yeah. So 
apparently they had uh, one of the people who, the director of that studio, had a relationship, I believe, with Kojima, and they got together and they were trying to come up with ways to make that work, and they decided to to make this on the GameCube. But that was always a weird one to me with that situation because two was huge when that came out it was this massive massive deal and eventually to go to the xbox you know which was which was good to see that as well um but it it was kind of strange i think the problem they ran into with metal gear solid 3 is that the gamecube just wasn't selling like the two, ps2 and to mm -hmm. the point where they weren't sure if it was worth even doing it so they just went with one system with the ps2 at the time and just developed for that because like even I remember when Resident Evil 4 got announced, and that was legitimately surprising to people. Because they're like, oh, it's the, the GameCube's getting Resident Evil 4. How is that happening? And we know it's because Nintendo and Capcom came up with a deal for a bunch of games, and that was one of them. But it because it's it's this hard M-rated Resident Evil game that's exclusive to the system with a handle, it, uh, this cube, it was, it was a really weird thing to people at that time. So I think there was... One, I think Nintendo was harder to work with back then. I will say that there's a there's a lot of history behind them not even sending out dev kits until after the system was out. Those kind of things that I, I think really hurt relations with developers, and it's 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 pretty well documented. There's even more recent articles as I think it was like two or three years ago detailing some of these shortcomings for Nintendo with developer relations then, which have gotten a lot better now. I will say that, but. It's, uh, it was a tough time for developers then with the GameCube and just trying to make something work with it. Yeah, well, I, the GameCube had a lot of uh, shortcomings in, in the form of uh, barely any online multiplayer. It had it. Yeah. You could do it on there, uh, but it, you could buy the uh, the broadband adapter, and it pretty much only worked with Fantasy Star Online, and, and that was pretty much it. Outside of LAN play for games like Mario Kart and Kirby uh, Air Ride, uh, but outside of that, like, it just wasn't used, which kind of makes you wonder, like, why did Sega put Fantasy Star Online on the GameCube? I think I, the the reasoning was they said, like, oh, well, it's structurally very similar to the Dreamcast, but it's just, like, it's just, like, there's barely any online multiplayer uh, yeah. connectivity on this system, so why put this online-focused game on here it eventually went to xbox but i know people who played it on the xbox i didn't know anyone who played it on the gamecube i, I remember getting it because it had like the single player component but i i'd never heard of anyone really going online with it that much uh, so i i don't really know why they did that that was a very strange one at least the xbox already had an ethernet port on it out of the box you didn't have to buy this 100 150 dollar or something attachment for your for your system yeah it's it's very strange because nintendo seems very stubborn about evolving and, and changing and, and kind of like going with the flow kind of uh, just following in the footsteps of like other companies it, it feels like they mm. very much want to be kind of the pioneer of certain things and and they weren't for online multiplayer so they were just kind of like no like i remember like a quote from them at that time was just like people don't want to play online like they were just like yeah. no uh but now yeah. and i think they said a very similar thing about dlc they were like we're never going to do paid dlc we, do, we we want our games to be complete and now you know in this year we're getting a bunch of games from nintendo that are so yeah. focused on online multiplayer and are so uh reliant on downloadable content and updates and, and all of that stuff it's a subscription service even now mm -hmm. yeah it's mm. it's pretty wild to see how eventually they do kind of uh they do get their get get into that kind of stuff but they are usually pretty stubborn about those things at first and mm -hmm. i think that really did kind of hurt them uh with the gamecube but it's it's interesting to kind of just think about like what could they have really done differently with the gamecube to kind of make it a, a huge success because i'm not really sure how much they really could have done considering um the xbox was pretty much everything like had pretty much everything with it and it barely did better than the gamecube and that could probably be right. um a testament to the fact that you know microsoft it, it was a brand new it was a brand new thing you know this was the first xbox microsoft had never done a game console before this so you know nintendo and sony at least had that brand recognition but with Sony, the plays the original PlayStation sold 100 million out the gate, so I don't really think yeah. that's that's a problem. So it's kind of interesting. I feel like no matter what Nintendo would have done, this was Sony's generation to win. I think I think Nintendo ran into issues, like I said, with developers, but also with 
they they just for some reason they desperately wanted to be different when they didn't have to with their disc reader I, I just i don't know why they refused to do anything with dvd playback it was so weird even at the time it was like oh why does the gamecube use these little discs and then sometimes you'd buy a third party game and it would have two mini dvds in there because it couldn't fit it on one of them and it's so strange oh, man. when like tiger woods pga tour like yes, 2005 yeah, had two cool. discs and it's just like man what are we doing here <laughs> this is this is getting ridiculous i've wondered if that would have helped i mean i assume it would have because then they could have advertised that they have that dvd functionality but i mean the gamecube was so cheap even at the time and maybe that's one of the reasons they were able to make it so cheap is because it didn't have dvd playback or something i'm not sure uh, but it was they had it down to a hundred dollars or something later in its generation it still wasn't selling so it has to be an, an image problem or I, I don't know it but you also gotta think of the the momentum that sony had as you mentioned of the ps1 generation coming out of that showing up out of a failed partnership with Nintendo, vastly outselling the Nintendo 64, and then rolling into the PS2 generation with full backwards compatibility for games that you already had on the PS1. So it was probably a fairly easy transition for PlayStation owners to move to that PS2 because their games all still worked. So in that sense, you replace your PS1 with a PS2, you have DVD capabilities now, you have this new library, and all your PS1 discs just work. You pop them in and they go. Yeah, so e either way, like, I feel like like there wasn't a lot Nintendo could have done differently with the GameCube, um, where it's just like, yeah, including DVD playback, probably would have sold a couple more million consoles, but I don't think it would have sold nearly as much as, as the PlayStation 2 because, like you said, Sony had so much momentum going in from the PS1. You know, they sold so many systems, so many people had so many games for that. And then you have this PS2. Not only does it play DVD movies, but you can play all your PS1 games. So it's instantly kind of attractive to a hundred and like an install base of 100 million uh, players. And uh, I think that was really important, whereas with the GameCube, it just kind of felt like, like, oh, the cheap console for kids, uh, where, you know, it wasn't always that, but that's just like based on everything Nintendo did for it, did with it, uh, it just kind of ended up getting that reputation because the only games that really made sense to bring to it were like a lot of licensed kids games and games that had that colorful cartoony style that kind of appealed to pre-existing Nintendo fans. Um, so at least like, uh, back, back in the day, uh, when I had the GameCube, uh, like I, I got it when I was around like six, <laughs> maybe seven. Uh, so I was the prime demographic, the target demographic for such a, such a baby system. But I, uh, yeah, I, I got that with the Game Boy player initially that was the only thing i got with my gamecube was the game boy oh, wow player. interesting yeah okay so it was uh which i mean hey if if sony sold uh, like all those ps2s to 100 million uh ps1 owners you'd think nintendo would have been able to sell that gamecube to the hundreds of millions of people who own game boy systems but uh i i i think the game boy player was put out around like 2003 or so and it, um it, it felt like Nintendo was just trying to add that much more value to the GameCube, and I think they really did. This is like one of the best accessories Nintendo has ever released uh, for anything, uh, and that was pretty much all I used my GameCube for for the first couple months. Was just it was just a Game Boy. Yeah, it was just a way to play Game Boy games on my TV. It did the job. It was pretty good. I sure I still use the Game Boy sure. Play. Well, I haven't been using it recently because I have the analog pocket. And I just kind of hooked that up to the mm. TV, which is, uh, you know, quite it works very well. But yeah, uh, I, I think I think that was uh, at least like one of the uh, when that's only one of the reasons why I think the GameCube was really like one of the most like bang for your buck Nintendo systems. That says something because I think like the library as a whole. You just have like all major Nintendo franchises represented. And on top of that, you do have mm. like a decent amount of third party support. It's not really like everything that you could have possibly wanted, but there was at least like games from various different series represented there. There was enough different genres, but you know, in the end, I feel like there were still a lot of gaps in the library. But if you owned a GameCube at the time, it 
it kind of forced you to try playing games that maybe you weren't playing or just games that a lot of other GameCube players were playing at the time. And I think that kind of creates this sense of community between people who owned a GameCube. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like, oh yeah, we all played these games. Whereas like PlayStation 2 owners, they, they had like <laughs> 2000 games to pick from. So, you know, like everybody yeah. played different games. I'm trying to think of the first, the first games I was really playing on the GameCube. I think, I think, I feel like one was Luigi's Mansion, and it's funny. I remember the GameCube first came out, and I didn't get it initially when it first first came out because basically you'd have to wait for, for me anyway, Christmas or birthday at that time to get the big item. And unfortunately, my birthday is right around Christmas time, so it, it, it weren't they weren't able to find one that year. And I think I just got more games for some of my other stuff. It might have been N64 and Dreamcast Christmas that year, but it was the following Christmas that I did get the GameCube. So I was like a year late to it or so, but uh, being you know, like 12 or 13, getting the GameCube even then as a big deal, right? You know, getting in on the ground floor for the generation. And I remember, I think the day after Christmas, I went to the store, cause that's what happens. If you got a system at Christmas, and you're missing something, you had to sit there and wait until the next day yeah. <laughs> when the stores would reopen. Um, nowadays, they just make these big retail stores make make the employees go in. It's Christmas. Who cares? Yeah. Get in there. <laughs> but uh, but back then, you had the wait. So if you needed batteries, I'm well, just going to sit there and look at your systems. Or I'm sorry, we would read the manuals, things that would come with games back then. Anyway, uh, we, we would basically have to hang out with our system until it was time to go to the store the next day. And I... I believe the first game I purchased for the GameCube with my own money, which was birthday money at the time, was Smash Brothers Melee. And a great game. Big time game then. There's so much content to that title. That was the killer app. That was yep. like the thing that you really could you if, if you owned a PS2 or Xbox, you really couldn't be like, oh well I have kind of an alternative to that on my system. Like no, there there was nothing else like Smash Brothers at the time. Um, yep. still really isn't, you know, like it, it, Smash Brothers will always be kind of like, it, it's the Mario Kart of its own genre of like party fighter game. I remember I, I got it. And I, cause I was playing it a lot. I played it a lot on the Nintendo 64. Like we were on the school bus trading secrets about how to unlock Luigi and Captain Falcon and stuff for the 64 version. But I got it on the GameCube and I'm playing it. And I remember you can pause the game. And when you do it zooms in on your character and you can see all the detail. And I'm sitting there for had to have been five or ten minutes in the middle of a match with my brothers and i'm like hold on look at mario's buttons <laughs> it's like you can see like all the spots like sewn in and stuff like this is this is mind-blowing stuff so we we had uh we had smash brothers melee then but i think the games that i got because the first game i remember playing on the gamecube it wasn't my gamecube it was the kiosk at mcdonald's when it first came out they installed kiosks at mcdonald's uh, they replaced the nintendo 64 ones and that was Luigi's Mansion because that launched with the GameCube, but they were they must have had some deal with McDonald's or something I don't know, but they were showing off, showing it off there. The GameCube always felt like the the prime like dentist office game console or just yeah. like something that like everybody like anybody that owned a business could just buy and they could be like we'll just set this up for the kids to play but those were more so for like advertising purposes and uh yeah i remember yep. they kept those up for quite a while after like there's some there's probably some random mcdonald's out there that still have like these set up and they're just absolutely torn to bits absolutely disgusting but <laughs> yeah the the launch titles um I remember, like, the GameCube had uh, two Nintendo published launch titles. You got Wave Race and Luigi's Mansion. And both are great games, but, mm. uh, you know, both are also kind of like, you know, you know, like, okay, these do for launch, but, you know, they were both pretty, like, like pretty short games. At least Luigi's Mansion was mainly single player and very, well, yep. isn't only single player and very short. Uh, and then Wave Race was still kind of like, you know, what you see is what you get with Ra Wave Race, you know, very good, but um yeah but you also got like super monkey ball uh you got crazy taxi uh and a couple of the sports games at the time a bunch of licensed games um and uh then you got like melee and uh pikmin won uh, a couple weeks later but uh i i feel like the gamecube also had had a couple like months where there, there just wasn't much going on and mm -hmm. uh this was already like two years into the ps2's life and uh i i think sony kind of had that year head start Yep. And Xbox had Halo launch with its system around the exact same time That's as big deal. the GameCube launch. <laughs> I think the other game that I, the other games that I got though, they weren't even Nintendo games. One was 
Well, kind of. I mean, I was kind of in collaboration with Nintendo. One was Rogue Squadron, mm -hmm. which the thing that with this game and kind of with the other one too, the other one was WrestleMania 18 X8. Uh, loved all the wrestling games back then. I played them so much on the PS2 and then the GameCube. And I remember the big thing then, which is funny to look back on now, uh, coming from the Nintendo 64 where I had like No Mercy and WrestleMania 2000 and those, going to the GameCube, having full motion video play on the Titantrons was the biggest mind-blowing event to me ever. It's like, oh my gosh, look at this. There's that actual video in the game. And mm -hmm. they did the same thing with Rogue Squadron when you first turn that game on. It was like parts of the movie playing on the title screen. And when yeah. you blew up the Death Star, they did that quick cut transition to the scene from the movie with it blowing up. And I was like, this is, this is it. It's never getting any better. This is great. We have actual full motion video that l doesn't look terrible like the Sega CD in the game. This is, this is impressive stuff. Hey, I think uh, Star Wars Rogue Squadron still looks damn good today. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The, uh, it looks good, it, runs well, yeah. Yeah, it looks, I mean like there are certain times where like just the way the shadows look and just the way everything kind of just like moves, it looks so similar to the actual movies. It, it's, it's pretty wild how they were able to pull that off back in 2001. Um, but yeah, I, I mainly had, uh, I, I think like one of my first games, this is really rough because one of my first games for the GameCube back then, you know, I mainly had to play Game Boy games on it. And then one of my first games was Sonic Mega Collection, which okay, is okay. again, like barely. I had that one. Yeah. Well, bar barely anything that's actually like, oh man, 3D and actual we'll see yeah. what the GameCube can do. But it just kind of felt like a lot of these video game compilations at the time, had so much more like love put into them feeling like more so actual releases rather than just a vessel to put out new games uh, or old games on, on new systems. I just have like a ton of memories with that one, just how everything is like presented. It just feels really good. There, there wasn't a ton. I, I only had like a handful of GameCube games as a kid. Most of my experience came from like playing at friends' houses. That's where we'd play like Smash Brothers Melee and Mario Kart and all those games. Mm. Eventually bought like Mario Sunshine from a friend. Uh, and you know, I, it, there, there was just so much stuff that I didn't experience until years later. And now it's kind of like overwhelming just the amount of good content on the GameCube. And I think a lot of other people notice that with just how expensive yeah. this all is. <laughs> well, it doesn't help that they didn't sell a lot of systems technically. So yeah. even the systems get out there, but then you also have to consider that that influences how many copies of games they actually put out into the market. So we're mm. already fighting for a limited supply of them then technically, but definitely now. So prices have only jumped further and further. And like there were times, I remember with Gotcha Force, I was really trying to decide if I wanted to buy the thing. I'm like, I don't know. It's it's like $200 for this game, but it is part of the collection and I feel like it'll go. Now it's like, this game's like $800. I'm like, wow, I did not expect. I mean, it's good that I guess I bought it then or like Pokemon XD was 50 bucks back then. Now it's four times that. I mean, it's weird stuff, but it, people fighting over a limited supply of games and the games themselves, I think are just very intriguing to people right now. I remember like couple years into the Wii's life, even like around like uh, when the eighth generation started, I believe you could get a GameCube for like 20, 30 bucks. Yep. Pretty yep. easy. It was cheap. It was yeah, cheap. mainly because yep. like everybody technically already kind of had a GameCube with the Wii. People still kind of already have a GameCube with the Wii. How much do like Wii systems go for these days? Like original Wii systems? They're like 70 or 80 bucks, I think now. Yeah. They're, they're getting a little up there too, just because like so many people ended up going like just like oh man i remember this i want to play it again so like there's just more demand and that's really cool i i think it's a, it's kind of like a balancing act where it's just like this is really cool i love seeing people kind of like get into the hobby of just looking back at older games and just enjoying like collecting all this stuff um I think it's a really great hobby to get into, but it also drives up the price like mad, and it, does. it is it, does. it is very overwhelming. Um, you have been chipping away at like a uh, a complete GameCube set. How is that? How is that going? I'm working at it, got pretty good. I've been buying games here and there that, and some of them I didn't even realize released on the GameCube. Like recently, I got Hitman Two, and I I didn't oh, even yeah. I didn't even realize that released on the GameCube because back then. I had it on the original Xbox. I didn't even think to check for it on the GameCube at that time because, as I mentioned, there was kind of that 
image of the GameCube, and I'm like, I don't, I don't even know if this is out on the. I, I, I saw it on the store <laughs> shelf. I wanted the new Hitman game. Like, ah, let's get it on the Xbox. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but like stuff like that is is pretty cool to just come across. And then the thing with that is that when I go to conventions or other other means on eBay and stuff, it's it's quickly gone from I'm gonna buy five or six GameCube games that are much more reasonably priced to where I'm getting more and more down to. I guess I'm going to buy one GameCube game because they're just, <laughs> you get to the point where I don't find a reason to buy sports games on eBay because the shipping ends up being the same as the game itself. I'd rather buy those at a convention. Mm -hmm. um, but then, on the other hand, the more expensive games I've bought, I'm going to say at least two, they were like $70 or $80 range. And I get it. The person's like, mint condition i get it i flip it over i'm like there's just scratches all over this thing what is this <laughs> so i just it's this weird thing where i maybe i go on ebay and I look for the 20 or 30 dollar games where i'm like i'll take a chance on this um but anything more than that i kind of want to see in person before i before i put the money down so it's it's getting harder as i continue to shrink down the, the overall size. also i gotta figure out a way to inventory this stuff i'm realizing that too uh <laughs> other than taking a picture of my shelf and occasionally zooming back in looking for it i need to get like an inventory app or something yeah i've I, i've uh i've tried doing that in the past um where like I'll, I'll find like those like apps that are like oh collecting apps and all that and you get to put all that stuff in and that'll like keep me busy for a couple hours one day but then i forget to do it later <laughs> i'm just like ah oh, yeah i'll do i'll do this later um but yeah that, that is that is probably a good thing because like yeah when you go out and go out uh the different stores sometimes like i'll buy games that i completely forgot i already owned it's getting to that sad point where it's just like oh man i'm like i didn't i forgot i even owned this game and uh yeah i've been i've been chipping away getting more and more gamecube stuff uh just because i find that i prefer playing it comp like that's my preferred way to play a lot of those games um mm. from that generation i originally kind of had the collecting mindset uh if i'm going to buy a multi-platform game from the sixth generation i will get the xbox version because it is generally the best but sure uh, i just find myself more likely and more willing to play a, a multi-plat game from that generation if i'm playing the gamecube version just because like that's just you know that's just the control i prefer that's the <laughs> system i prefer all of that um so i've been just buying more and more stuff even if i have it on the uh on the original xbox i've been picking up the gamecube version and uh the, the shelf is starting to fill up quite a bit i think i like the, the gamecube case more than the other two as well and if i really sit down and put them all next to each other the xbox case for some reason like the original xbox just felt cheap to me mm -hmm. i mean i don't mind that it's green but it's just it just felt very plasticky it's just very uh, mountain dew yeah. green and just yeah uh, it's it's also um I don't know. I find that a lot of times, uh, you, like if you buy a used original Xbox game, it'll come in a 360 case or, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of like I'm like, okay, well, I'll take, I'll do, I'll take it, but like. Eh. If you get that authentic Nintendo GameCube case, and it just feels higher quality too. I, I don't know if it's thicker plastic or because it has to support the smaller disc that you drop into it, but there is a satisfying click when you put it into the case well i cannot i do not recall getting any gamecube game with like a chipped case like a, a case with like the top where it's just like oh man you know like plastic's missing it's cracked or anything like that i don't really remember getting any gamecube game that looks like that ps2 and xbox like i have a i have a good few couple of games just sure. like that i'll tell you when they try to pull that thing where they put the gamecube game in a basic replacement case that's that's the worst oh that's just that happens that, I, that's how you I'm know you don't want to you're never coming back to that place yeah. <laughs> never coming back to them <laughs> i need the legit nintendo gamecube case okay mm. <laughs> that's uh it just it just stacks really nicely on the shelf i don't know it just goes unless you get that player's choice one yeah that's pretty rough i have two right yeah. now one i can't I, I i can't go without mainly because it's a it's Pac-Man World 2 plus Pac-Man Versus, and that uh, only released as a player's choice, unfortunately. Which one, I guess, is, is your least favorite then? The, I think Xbox had, what, like the Platinum kind of title? The the GameCube, or the, the PS2 had, like, the red, you know, the greatest hits, and the GameCube had the player's choice. Which one is the most annoying to you to look at on the shelf? Here's the thing. I mean, I mean like, from that generation or just in general? Because I have a general one. I guess from that generation specifically, yeah. like you line them up and they're all, let's just say this, picture your shelf, 
complete collection of GameCube games, but for some reason you have one that's player's choice. Do the same thing on the Xbox <laughs> and the th same thing on the PS2. Which one makes you the most mad? Here's the thing. It's, <laughs> it's a little tricky because... Uh -huh. Xbox is like the whole damn case is a different color. It's mm, and like the true. spine, the spine entirely is like this entirely different thing. Whereas GameCube, like yeah, the yellow is annoying, but it's also kind of like they don't do anything more than that. And just and in some ways, you know, like you kind of look at that and you're just like, you know what? Like it looks kind of cool. I had uh, my copy of Sonic Mega Collection when I was younger was a player's choice version. And that game kind of had like a bit of a yellow aesthetic on the spine, either way, from what I remember. So it's kind of like, ah, oh, that's fine. I, I originally had like Crazy Taxi on the GameCube, and that was a player's choice. Well, I, I still have it, but I don't have the player's choice version anymore. And that entire spine, like the Crazy Taxi spine was yellow. And then, you know, the player's choice bottom was yellow too. So it's just like, it almost felt like it was, you know, it was destiny. Yeah, I did get to a point where I had to buy a couple games again because one was a player's choice. So I was yeah. like, can't do it. <laughs> can't can't do this. I definitely prefer. The only other one that I have that's still player's choice is uh, Four Swords Adventures. Um, just because I'm okay. just like, yeah. I just haven't gone around to uh, getting a different one. And it's, it's pretty rough when like, I only have two games that are player's choice across like like over a hundred regular GameCube games, so it's just this sea of black spines, and then just two. Uh, PS2's just looks really like I just think it looks ugly. It's not like it, it just it looks boring. It looks like an old person's game system, the burgundy <laughs> whatever greatest hits. Um, I would say I I would say I. God, that's tricky. They all are horrible in their own special ways. <laughs> yeah, I know. Damn. Well, I, the GameCube one sticks out the most. The GameCube one sticks out immediately the most, but I think I think those are probably like if you're going through for like a complete set of nothing but player's choice, like that could be kind of fun. <laughs> that could be kind of fun if you're doing fun or, yeah, the entire or fun. thing. <laughs> um, but my least favorite in general is, have you ever seen like Xbox 360 games that are platinum hits? Yeah, those look weird. I mean, like they, they have like a couple different variants of them where like for a little bit there, um, I had like a platinum hit Skyrim and like the spine was, you know, longer than usual. Like it's uh, Xbox 360 yep. platinum hits. And then the gradient went from like gray to white. So you couldn't even read the rest of the logo. And then the spine showing the game logo was just nothing but pure white with like aerial text that said the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing with this one. <laughs> and like they, they, they just, they weren't consistent throughout that entire generation. They just had weird versions of platinum hits. They had like three different versions of platinum hits games, but I digress. What's the take on the handle for the GameCube. Oh, it's great. It's unnecessary, but I think it completes the image. Have you ever tried photoshopping a GameCube to have uh, to not have the handle? I mean, I can take it. I can technically take it off and and take a picture. I thought about that. Just removing the handle and taking a picture of it to see what people would say it looks online. Naked. It <laughs> just, doesn't look right. I'm not going to say anything about it. I would just take a picture of it on the sh uh, like standing up kind of mm. and I would put no message and just see what people say. Uh, yeah, it just, it, it's something where, like, technically speaking, it should look fine. But we're so used to it with the handle that it just, it looks wrong. And I, you don't really think about it, but it's just like, yeah, pretty much whenever I do carry the GameCube around, I do use the handle. It does come in handy. I think I used it twice, maybe back in the day, to be honest. I mean, like, you're going out of your way to think of it. Let, let's imagine you're bringing the GameCube over to, like, your workbench. You're going to work on it. Are you really carrying it? Like, that's true. No, that now, yeah, now I'm swinging this thing around. Yeah, yeah probably gonna be holding it by the handle. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about how it's just like, oh, what if the GameCube had DVD playback? It technically kind of did with one model. I have over there mm, the Q. Uh, in the corner of my eye. I have the Panasonic Q. I did recently test that out, and uh, yeah, my 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 version works. I haven't tried out DVDs with it yet, but um, my version works. And uh, yeah, it's it's a very cool piece of hardware. Very easy to see why it did not come over to the States and very easy to see why it did not help the GameCube very much. <laughs> no, it really did. It's literally I mean, a GameCube and DVD player <laughs> duct taped together pretty much. That's that's what it is. Panasonic was, they were trying some things apparently, but it did, it did not work. Cool piece for the collection, but that's kind of oh, it. Sure. It's uh, no, not much other reason to really own it, I guess, other than say, hey, look, I can put a DVD, but it's like region locked to the DVD. I think in Japan. I don't. I don't know if you can completely region free that thing, but um, 
I don't know. It's 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 a cool piece of history, I guess. But that's it's up there to me with like the PSX, the DVR for the PlayStation. Uh, this is something, that, something like that. At least the Panasonic Q works. The PSX yeah. is like, yeah, like that thing. It is impossible to find one that is uh, in working condition. Uh, I, I think you can probably find some that maybe turn on, but outside yeah. of that, they yep. ain't gonna they ain't gonna do much outside of that. Um, but I always thought that was like really cool. Have you ever seen like the uh, the cars with the uh, the little DVD player built in with like a Game Boy Advance also built in? Yeah, I've seen I've seen pictures of it online. I've never like witnessed one working. <laughs> well, I, I I had a friend that had one installed in his car. He never made a big deal what? about it. Yeah, I was just like, I, how do you not make a big deal about that? That's the first thing you say. Literally, when you meet he was somebody, just like, right? oh yeah, this was like my dad's old car, or my you know, this was like my parents' old car, and you know, I just got it when you know, I. I you know, got my license. That's the first thing you say. You introduce yourself, and then you say, I have a Game Boy Advance in my car. Well, that's what I did. Um, I made a video on the game. I, I made a, a Scott the Waz episode on the Game Boy Advance, and I was just like, uh, how do I end this thing? Oh, uh, yeah, I have a friend with a Game Boy car, so I'll, uh, I'll just I'll just incorporate that somehow. I've seen it a couple places here and there. I saw it on, like, eBay once and, uh, and uh, at, like, too many games another time. But yeah, it, it's just like I think Nintendo was just making some moves with just incorporating uh, their uh, their brands in a couple different places like that. I wish they would do that now. That that, that would be a cool thing if there was like a Switch, like uh, there was a Nintendo Switch branded. You just put like, the cartridge in your dashboard. That'd be pretty. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> but overall, what would you say is like the top games to get? on the GameCube these days. Like, get, play, enjoy, mm. all of that. Even if they've been re-released elsewhere. a lot In a lot of cases, like, the games still play the best on the GameCube. Like, you look at uh, Tales of Symphonia Remastered is coming out on Nintendo Switch, and uh, in many ways, you can say the GameCube one is still superior. Yep, best one. I can't I can't believe what they've did, travesty what they've done to that game. <laughs> uh, yeah, the GameCube one, though, I would say that's a good one. 60 FPS on the GameCube, art style carries through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll put that up there. Uh, let me think. I Soul Calibur 2 because Link is in it, and I think the game still holds up and looks great today. Oh, for it sure. It's very it's, fluid. It's so it's such a shame that uh, Soul Calibur 3 was a PS2 exclusive after that. Yeah, the guest character thing was really cool. I liked that they got a different character for each system, and really everyone felt kind of unique that way. It was, it was cool. You know what was a real shame was uh, they did Soul Calibur 2 HD, and were the guest characters still like exclusive to, like, Xbox and PlayStation. Yeah, they had to remove. I I feel like they had to remove most. Maybe Spawn was still in there. I I, I know Link wasn't in it. But. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that that's kind of my point. How it's just like that was that was released around the time like that was released like 2013. So the Wii U was was a thing, and like yeah, it didn't come to the Wii U. That was just like oh man, like that would have been so cool to see that come back with uh with Link and Toe. Uh, but yeah, definitely definitely one of the coolest games. Soul Calibur was genuinely like the like premiere like oh my god you gotta get this like this is like what shows off how how great these new systems are just it did that for dreamcast and then it was this awesome experience across all the platforms uh on ps2 xbox and um and gamecube with soul Calibur 2 and then after that it kind of just you know you know like soul Calibur just isn't as big of a deal as it once was which is a shame yeah. because it's still you know it's it's still I think it's one of the most accessible and fun fighting game series for, like, just anybody to oh, play. Yeah. Whether it's, like, hardcore or casual. Um, you know, if you want a button mash, it's still a pretty fun time. So, uh, but, yeah, that is for sure a must-have on GameCube. That, I have uh, Day of Reckoning 2. It's a wrestling game. I think it's a very good wrestling game. <laughs> At the time, they were doing a lot with the, the SmackDown series on the PS2, but... They switched over to the Day of Reckoning series after WrestleMania 19, and then they built on top of the first one that was very good with two, and I think that's uh, one of the better wrestling games for that generation overall. And it's exclusive to the GameCube, so that's the only place you can technically oh. play it, but it it was a very good wrestling game. It had actually an interesting story, too. Mm. I, I mean, the stories in those games typically aren't very good, but <laughs> it was... I guess in terms of bad stories across the board for these wrestling games, that was like in the top tier mm. <laughs> for it. Uh, that one was very good though. Uh, and I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw Star Fox Adventures in there. Ah, uh, the uh, Star Fox Adventures. So you were, you were on the, uh, you were, you were, um, you, you were on the message boards back then, you know? So it's just like, you, you knew what the, uh, what the, what the, what the takes were back then. And in terms of just yeah. like how, how people were feeling. 
like how how were people feeling about that one back in the day did you did you have the same kind of level of like kind of like this isn't this isn't what i asked for or were you always kind of like this is a good game i liked i liked wind waker i, I did so that was the one that i think at, at the time was the most controversial i liked Star Fox adventures back then too but people didn't like it because it wasn't a Star Fox game and at the time i i feel like it wasn't as well known that it wasn't originally a Star Fox game. I think that came out a little later, but it was pretty yeah. obvious that it wasn't the traditional Star Fox game. And I was I was okay with it after I played it. I thought at the time we were really pushing for visuals and that, I mean, that was a pretty big graphical leap from the Nintendo 64. And it ran really well. It was like 60 FPS and even had the fur physics and stuff. So it had, <laughs> in that sense, I think Rare did a really good job with it. Uh, I don't I don't know if the gameplay is going to hold up now, uh, but I, I still think it's a pretty cool snapshot in time for what was possible on a tactical level back then. It feels like a, a game prime for for a remake, just like kind of a touch up in terms of just like kind of modernizing yep. the uh, the feel of it, because uh, from from what I played, like it's just it it's a very great looking game with a ton of just like good ideas and design elements but it just it feels like it just kind of needs that that little just like tweak of uh you know kind of modern controls think, just kind of like that i think the way you can take star fox now and, and move it to the next level with a new concept is to legitimately take star fox adventures and star fox assault or zero or whatever the bit traditional star fox and just mash them together uh, I, mm -hmm. I feel like they could probably do something with that but that's just we'll, we'll see about that I, I star fox adventures i think is is pretty good mario strikers is good and it's a little different i'll throw sega soccer slam in there sega soccer slam yeah two two arcade soccer games <laughs> yeah yeah those those were good back then i think i think mario strikers was just this really wacky idea back then it was it was really cool to see like how much they were just they that still might be the only Nintendo system with like all four of those Mario sports, just mm -hmm. all yep. represented. You got golf, tennis, baseball, and uh, and strikers. But some of the best versions. Of baseball is awesome. Baseball is yeah. really good. Yeah, it, it just kind of felt like they were. Uh, it, it felt like they just kind of accepted how like the GameCube was kind of the big local multiplayer system. That was where you went for local multiplayer. So that's where they just they were like, all right, let's just throw it all in here. Let's just do like. Let's do 15 Mario parties. Why not? Which, uh, yeah, they had the that that was their yearly franchise back then. It's crazy to look oh, it back was. at it because, like That's now, so weird. Like, yeah, we got Super Mario Party, and then what? Like three years later, we got another Mario Party that is a remake of mini games and boards from previous versions. So it's just like, wow. but they they really got the most out of uh, doing yearly back then. I mean, like you look at like those games and like yeah, I mean like you play one Mario Party, pretty much played them all at least from the GameCube. But uh, you know each one still had like a decent amount of differences and uh, and they were able to pump those out. It just shows like how much quicker game development was back then. Yeah. They were able to put out so much stuff. It is wild. We got like three Zelda games on the GameCube. Three like full fledged Zelda games if you want to count Four Swords Adventures. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, yeah. But Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and then that, yeah, those, those are good. I mean, th I think those are some good titles. I'm trying to think of anything really, really, really cheap, although I might do I a video for that at some point. Because I can be like, oh, de definitely get Fire Emblem. That's that's the one to get. And it's like <laughs> hundreds of dollars. I, I'm trying to not recommend stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very approachable. I'm looking at my collection here. Uh, there is a, uh, there, there was. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of peering through this. Uh, there, there. This was a good era where I, I feel like everybody kind of looks back at like a couple licensed games and they're just like, oh yeah, that was the one. You had Simpsons Hit and Run on the GameCube. Yep. That was, that was, that was our game, Grand Theft Auto. On the it kind of was, wasn't was it? Also, yeah. Yeah. That was also the Grand Theft Auto I could buy without having to uh, beg my mom to uh, to help me buy it for me since it was T-rated. But I have a lot of fun <laughs> memories of that one. That was a fun one. That I, I can still probably pop that in now and have a good time with it. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely, you can. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people back in the day, people my age were just like, oh, they were, you had uh, the, the SpongeBob game Battle for Bikini Bottom. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes along with the Tales of Symphonia remastered one where I'd say I would probably prefer playing that on GameCube compared to the, uh, the modern remake. Um, you know, there are still games that just play really well on that old system. 
Uh, but I'm kind of looking. We got you, you had like Monkey Ball one and two. You had a weird one, Monkey Ball Adventure. You had uh, <laughs> you had Beautiful Joe one and two. You had the Capcom five, which ended up being the Capcom four, and technically the Capcom one because only one of those games remained exclusive. Uh, where Capcom and Nintendo had uh, an exclusivity deal, uh, where well, I, I don't even think did they was that ever actually a thing, or was that more so something fans coined? I feel like they actually referenced that in PR. Yeah, I think so too. I'm trying. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head because there was a there was also like Dead Phoenix, which was uh, which was a game Capcom was working on that was exclusive that they ended up canceling, and pretty much everything but Pino Three. <laughs> uh, ended up going to other systems, so whatever. But the, you also had the Pikmin series. You had Animal Crossing. You had like the introduction of series. That Animal Crossing game's still really good. You know, things like sixty-four megabytes or something like that too. Mm-hmm. Thirty-two megabytes. Yeah. It's a little game. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, it, it, it's wild. I mean, are there are there any games that you remember from the GameCube that really aren't that great? Oh, um, like as in like, oh man, these like as in what what were what were some stinkers on oh, on the system? What do you say? That's a good question. What was what were some really bad games? I I will say the Call of Duty games back then, kind of rough. Oh no, Big Red one, finest yeah, hour. I can play them now. It's kind of rough to play those. <laughs> Well, those are like those weird like console versions back when Call of Duty was still kind of a PC only franchise, and they were kind of done by like not even B teams. I think they were like C teams. They were like they were just done by these uh, other developers. Have you ever seen a uh, World at War Final Fronts on PS2? Oh no, I've not seen that one. Is it bad? <laughs> Yeah, it's just a weird one where it's just like, why even bother? Why are you doing that? And that kind of that's kind of what the uh, console versions kind of feel like uh, back during that generation. Uh, but uh, I, I know one off the top of my head. There was a there was a Nintendo published Mickey Mouse game called uh, Disney's Magical Mirror, starring Mickey Mouse. It was developed by Capcom, and it is like one of the simplest point and click games. Ever. I, I didn't even know it was a point and click game. I assumed it was a platformer. Yeah. It was uh, it was published by Nintendo. They showed it off during like the uh, the uh, reveal of the GameCube at like E3 2001, uh, just with like a little little cinematic and whatnot. Uh, and uh, that that was a that was pretty bad. I think IGN gave it like a 4.5 out of 10, <laughs> which was shockingly low for like a Nintendo published game at the time. Uh, but that's that's one off the top of my head. I think Evol- I, I remember I rented Evolution Skateboarding. I'm looking at it now up there on the shelf, and that the controls are really bad in that game. Like I, especially coming from Tony Hawk Pro Skater, but you could skate as Solid Snake in the game. Yeah, I was gonna ask, wasn't that the Konami the skateboarding game? That was the uh, that was the redeeming factor, and why I always recommend it to people because you could you could skateboard as Snake. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> What about uh? Did you did you ever play the uh the EA sports games that included the Nintendo characters? As no, like a, I didn't. A bonus? I never played that. I it was like Street, right? NBA Street, NBA Street V three, and then SSX, not tricky. On tour, I think had them snowboarding, right? Yeah, and then there was also Fight Night Round two, with uh Little Mac. <laughs> I definitely didn't play Fight Night Round Two, but that sounds awesome. I I remember a street, and you could also play Super Punch Out as as a uh, in like you could just go into the menus and play Super Punch Out from the Super Nintendo. Okay, that's pretty cool. That that's was pretty, pretty wild. Cool. There's some. I didn't know that. I might look into that now. Huh. That is that is one to get. He also looks absolutely disgusting in the game. Does he? It's like an <laughs> EA created model. It's also not like the little oh, mag no. most people like would think. Like the guy with the. The, the blank the 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 black tank top and, and the black yeah, haircut green. no it's it's the yeah. super punch out version which which has green hair oh. and a, just this messed up looking face it's pretty it's pretty good i like I might it have to look that up on, even on youtube just to see <laughs> yeah i'd say ssx on tour feels the most like natural with like the mario characters snowboarding in that one nba street v3 just NBA feels Street's weird funny because they're like half the height of everyone else they're, like mascot <laughs> characters too like just yeah, the big heads great. and all of that it's it, it's pretty interesting uh but i'm looking i mean like th- they had some interesting third party releases uh they had smugglers run uh, War Zones, which was a version of like Smuggler's Run 2, and I think that was like the only Rockstar game published on the GameCube. Yeah, 
it was there weren't many unfortunately yeah it's just it's it's weird to see like the uh, like oh man they had to pick one rockstar game to put on the gamecube kind of like with the Not switch Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah kind of like with the switch for a while there um the only thing we ever got was la noir where it's just like hey you know i'm happy this is here but it's just like if you're gonna try anything <laughs> Why are you, why not do Grand Theft Auto? They did, and then it was broken as anything now. <laughs> yeah, so now I'm really sad. Uh, oh, but man. there's also, like, obviously the mainstays, Super Mario Sunshine. Mm -hmm. That was, yep. th that's still a fantastic game. I know a lot of people, you know, it's kind of the... People don't like debated, this game. It's the debated one. You know what, here's, the, here's what I think the issue is, all right? I think the game's just too hard for some people. It's a little tricky. I, th I think some people are just... Uh, Need to need to get get more in tune with their GameCube controller, maybe. <laughs> it's a little tricky. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't blame people. I, I I think the game is not perfect. It is a flawed Mario game, but yeah. it is pretty good. It is still quite good. Just the feel, just the control, just feels so good. And that that kind of goes yeah. into the controller of the GameCube. Genuinely, it is still one of my favorite controllers. It is like a controller that like even looking at like some of the best controllers nowadays. For some reason, the GameCube one still just feels like like natural in the hands it just yep. feels like everything just like you don't have to think about it. it it doesn't feel like like you could ever cramp up using the gamecube controller it just it feels so natural they got the ergonomics like dead on with this controller yeah. absolutely and they followed up with the wave word which is a fantastic controller i know there's no rumble to it but rumble even then was kind of like it's not like rumble now where you have the switch and the ps5 doing some cool things so i feel like People could take it or leave it at that time, but like the Wave Bird, you never really had to change out the batteries. I think I changed the batteries in mine two or three times over the entirety of the life of the system. I played it, and it, it was uh, it just kept that same ergonomic feel, and it was just it's a good controller. The only thing that would always get me is that D pad, little little blister inducing if you had to use it too much, mm -hmm. but it was within reach and it worked for selecting items or, or different things in the game or going through an inventory. But otherwise, the, the the joystick, I still think, is, like, the best feeling in the entire generation there with the, the left stick. And uh, the, the butt, when you first look at the button layout, it's kind of weird because it's this big A button, mm -hmm. X and Y circles around it, this little B button, but it, it works. Yeah. I, I don't know. It just, it just functions well. It does. It does work very well. I think... I think the idea behind the controller's button layout is really cool because it's something where you don't have to ever really look down other than using like mm -hmm. X or Y buttons. I think those are like the only ones where I'm like, if I could maybe change something, I would be like, oh, maybe make the X and Y buttons more distinct from each other because I think maybe sometimes I may mix them up. Yep. I'm, I'm just kind of hypothetically thinking. I can't really think of a time where I'm like, oh man, like that really messed me up. Like, no, nah, I'm just kind of thinking. Um, but I think it's really cool because no matter what, you don't have to look down at the controller. You know exactly where the A and B buttons are at the very least. Yep. You can just feel around, you know what they are. But I will say the button layout does make it kind of hard. Um, I feel like I mentioned this in like 20 videos I've produced, but it's just the idea of like... Um, when you'd use a GameCube controller on like the Wii for like virtual console games on the Super Nintendo, eh, it's 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 a little it gets a little funky with that button layout, but yeah. you know it, it works for the most part. Um, but overall, I, I I think well it does have some shortcomings. I think the ergonomics and the feel of like the buttons, the joystick, um, or the the thumbsticks, it is second to none. Like I, I you know the P, the PlayStation controllers are always fine. I think they're fine. Um, and they recently got like really like I think the DualSense controller feels fantastic. Um, oh, I think it's a great controller. Yeah. yeah, I think it feels fantastic. The DualShock Four. Have you have you felt like I felt like when I first put my hands on the DualShock Four, I was like, this is a great controller. But as the generation went on, I became less and less enthusiastic about it. I kind of felt a little more annoyed at that controller. The reason I think for that is because I the Dual the at the time the six axis, but the DualShock Three just I don't think that was a great controller, really, especially no. that six axis. It just it felt like a toy compared to the premium six hundred dollar console that they released then. Uh, so going from that to the DualShock Four, I think was a big enough jump to where you had that honeymoon phase that was extended a bit, and then as time went on, like you're saying, it kind of weared off a bit. And you're like, I don't know about this controller, and then we get the Dual Sense, and now it's like, oh, this this is a good controller. It just feels very meaty in the hands. Feels it just has a good weight to it. Good feel of the buttons, all that.
kind of a similar situation though with Nintendo because that 64 controller is an abomination. <laughs> and I mean, that should have been it for Nintendo right there. But then they come back with the GameCube controller. It is, it is tremendously better, like way better than what we had with the N64. <laughs> it is fantastic. And it is the controller that won't die. The fact that like Smash Brothers yeah. fans, even casual hardcore, like it's, it's like, I like, they're just like, we, I don't want to play with anything nope. but. And honestly, like playing, you know, like Smash Brothers Brawl, Wii U, Ultimate, all of those with anything but a um, a GameCube controller, it works. It works perfectly fine. You know, like th those games do not need the GameCube controller. But when I play those games with a GameCube controller, it just feels so much better. And Nintendo still produces it. Like yeah. they themselves produce the GameCube controller still. And it's you can go really to the store cool and buy it. That you can actually use it via numerous games. Pretty much any game that you can, you can kind of do cheese your way through it with a GameCube controller on the Nintendo Switch with the GameCube adapter. Well, some games, some games will actually make like control schemes for the GameCube controller and oh, which one was it? There's a racing game and I know I covered it. They Grid? used the GameCube it, it, I think it might have been great, but they use the they use the GameCube controller for the acceleration because it has those analog triggers. Yeah. And Nintendo themselves, they updated Mario Sunshine and uh, Mario 3D All-Stars. Yeah. Just something that just feels, it's just like, why would they do that? <laughs> it's just like, this this game, they 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 are they might have already took it down by the time they updated it, from, from what I remember. I like but... to think sometimes there are just old people in Nintendo who are nostalgic like us, and they're like, you know, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to patch this thing. This is getting done. Yeah. <laughs> I, just like to, I just like to imagine that in my mind, that that happens inside Nintendo. Yeah. But overall, I, I, I think, like, the library just, it, it did have some gaps, but I think there's always something, I, I feel like there's always something new to discover on the GameCube. You have all the Resident Evil games, pretty much at the time, all the main ones, which is just like, okay. <laughs> like This was a series that was born on PlayStation. It, it almost would have made more sense if it was like the Metal Gear games, just because like, well, mm -hmm. Metal Gear 1 kind of had like the NES version. Uh, so it's just like, it kind of has Nintendo roots, but like Resident Evil, like it, it was always just a PS1 game or a series that was really just made its home on PS1. And then, you know, like, boom, all the games are on, uh, all the games are on GameCube. And then you had Sega with all the Sonic games. Like, I, I think Sonic has so much of its fan base today that discovered that that series from all those games on GameCube, Adventure, Adventure 2, Heroes, yep. all of that stuff. Even if, like, you can look back at those and be like, eh, you know, like, be more critical of them. Uh, I think that was a good era for that series. I think, you know, like, even if, you know, some of those games don't hold up that well, um, I think it was still kind of a very positive era for that series and, and kind of, you know, got a lot of fans uh, for that franchise. And, uh, you know, you have... Uh, it's it very weird that, like, the Mega Man X games were still exclusive to PlayStation for the most part. I found that very strange. Oh, oh you mean, like... Uh the later ones because we had like the x collection on the switch we had the collection and command mission yeah command mission was a strange one yeah and we yeah. had that network transmission game. <laughs> network transmission which was pretty much like it's pretty much combining like battle network and kind of yeah. a little bit of classic mega man but it, yeah. it was very strange the good news is x7 and x8 are not very good games so there you go <laughs> x8 it's okay <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, it's better. It's better than X7. The though. one thing I was really annoying, by the way, is they did the Mega Man collection on the GameCube, the PS2, the, and the Xbox, the a &B right? The swap, are you going to say how they swapped the buttons on the, the, that collection? No, I remember me and my buddy both picked it up. He got it on the PS2. I got it on the GameCube. The GameCube version of the Mega Man collection does not have what the PS2 does, which is an entire episode from the series. Oh, on the disc that you unlock. The GameCube did not get that because it has a mini DVD. So they gave us like some wallpaper stuff or something. I don't know. It was it was really annoying. I was like, you get an entire episode? What? They did that with a couple of games. Like I remember like, it's just like, oh, the PS2 version has an opening cinematic and this and that. And it's weird because like, you know, history repeats itself. Um, I can kind of recall uh, like Team Sonic Racing on Nintendo Switch. Like, that game mm -hmm. on PS4 and Xbox One had, like, an opening cutscene, but on Switch, it doesn't, because they were like, eh, size limitations. Like, it's just like, boom. <laughs> and it just kind of felt like, oh, <sighs> man, I remember these days. Uh, but I, what I was saying was, like, the Mega Man Anniversary Collection on GameCube, like, uh, they swapped mm -hmm. the buttons, jump as B and shoot as A. Yeah, that was weird. I just, like, that was a strange I, one. I don't get this, man. This is disgusting. 
Uh, but, you know, we, I mean, just, just to wrap it up with, like, some other major title, you know, the Pokemon, it, it was so interesting to see, like, they kind of tried, like, a home console Pokemon game, not really, but still kind of, mm -hmm. with, like, Coliseum and XD just having, like, these full-blown, they, they were, they were basically full-blown RPGs in the Pokemon universe, they weren't actual mainline Pokemon games, they weren't developed by Game Freak, but it's very strange because Game Freak was always very adamant. They were like, no, Pokemon's a handheld series. Like, you know, you need it on the handheld. Um, you know, it makes more sense to put the party games or something or, or little spinoffs on the console. But here we have, like, games that are full-fledged RPGs. They may not be full-fledged Pokemon games. They're pretty much RPGs set in the Pokemon universe. Uh, they're very, they're very strange. XD was kind of, was an interesting one. Yeah. I, I remember the story with that is like the Pokemon were being turned evil or something. And they, I think they had like 60 some odd Pokemon in that mm. game. But that was, a. I remember getting that game and I was like, this is kind of strange to be playing this on the TV. I don't know if I'm allowed <laughs> to do this, but it was, uh, it, it was different. I liked seeing the fully rendered 3D Pokemon game there as opposed to, when we were playing them on the Game Boy. I think I was playing Gold and Silver at the time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it was it was much different seeing them up on the big screen, going through a story with a little character and yeah. stuff. So it was, it was but it kind of cool. felt like that was maybe there was like some urgency to be like, we gotta try to make the GameCube work. Maybe let's try to do like a Pokemon, like a kind of an RPG. That's, that's a good point. Like, I always yeah, kind of felt you, like yeah, maybe there was like a push to do that where it's just like, all right, well, let's do something that kind of looks and feels like a traditional Pokemon game. Because Pokemon, like Pokemon Coliseum, the way that was like, you know, branded and, and shown, it, it very much feels like this is the GameCube follow up to Pokemon Stadium, um, which is what it was. Right. But Pokemon XD, while it's a follow up to Coliseum, just the way like the title looks and the box art, it looks like a traditional Pokemon game. Like that just, it looks like something that you'd see and like, you know, that it looks like a regular Pokemon box art with like, uh, what is it, Lugia or something? I don't, I don't know what, the, I don't know what that thing is on the box art. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm saying, but either way, it looks like a traditional Pokemon game, uh, which it kind of feels like maybe Nintendo was like, eh, come on, let, let's, let's try this. Uh, but yeah, they had like, I mean, we could go on and on. You have Kirby Air Ride. You have all the 007 games. Agent Under Fire. That was a good one. That was everything that you, you would do something cool and it would play the 007 theme every time. It was like the sound bite that would constantly play. And at, when you're like four hours of the game, you're just, all right, I've heard I've, that enough. Thank you. Well, I, I, bought, I bought a lot of, uh, I, I think I bought all the 007 games for GameCube just because they're all really cheap. And I've been also buying a lot of stuff on GameCube mainly because like when I have people over, um, the immediate like thing that you know they do is like they, they check out like the game collection and if they're here enough long enough to like play a game gamecube is still like one of the easiest things to be like hey you want to play multiplayer let's play on the gamecube kind of thing yep like it's Absolutely. one of the easiest things and uh it doesn't even matter if a lot of games on gamecube like some of these are like not great like a lot of like people my age remember like some random like licensed games or a lot of random multiplayer games on here so I'm, i've just been buying a lot of stuff and i thought hey the 007 games like this it, i i do miss like getting those 007 games because like it was it was nice to always have kind of like first person shooters that were still like they didn't take themselves too seriously it was just mm. like kind of like a little colorful something t-rated um but still were like serious you know serious enough where it just it didn't feel like you know you were playing something as a joke but you know it's just a little more lighthearted than like a gritty call of duty or something you know, it's just nice to have that. I think now there are cons a lot of places are concerned that if they put the budget out for it, it'll feel like it's too generic or, or something. It has to be this cinematic, first-person, gritty kind of shooter. Uh, so yeah. it seems to be at least the way it's trending with costs around production for these games. I, I think you could still have something like that, like a fun arcade 007-style shooter uh, that's maybe eight to 10 hour campaign and that's sort of it. And I feel like you could still put it out there for 40 or 50 bucks and people would be interested. Yeah, exactly. But overall, uh, you know, I mean, we didn't even mention a lot of the stuff like, you know, like a lot of, a lot of the more weird games, Chibi Robo, Custom Robo, Geist, uh, Nintendo dipping into M rated games with eternal darkness and Geist. Uh, I'm trying to get Chibi Robo. That's that game's <laughs> got way too expensive by the way. Yeah, I got, I got Chibi Robo back before, back when it was still kind of expensive, but before it got too expensive. Some of these games I remember seeing on shelves for 40 bucks, like not even that, not when the system was new or anything, but 10 years ago. These, these games were very cheap. 
I remember seeing like Cubivore at oh, gosh. a uh, at like an old uh, game store that I frequented for like years. Like I, I would see it, and it was like sixty bucks, and I was like, not today. But <laughs> now it's like, how much is that game? Like three hundred, four hundred bucks? It's four hundred or five hundred dollars. It's it's a lot. That's that's the one that I wish I had picked up because it's from Atlas, and it's interesting to have that on the GameCube. So uh, someday. Sadly, like a Nintendo game, but it was published by Atlas over here. Like, I, I think yeah. there's trophies for it in Smash Brothers Melee. Um, yeah. It was developed by like Intelligent Systems, so like it's 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 a very oddball game. It's an interesting um, collaboration of companies for that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, overall, like there, there's so many games on the GameCube that like didn't even mention, but it it just shows like there's just never-ending stuff to talk about with this system. I think. It is my favorite because it just felt like Nintendo was firing at all cylinders. I feel like they were kind of like putting out like the best versions of their franchises at the time. You know, like it didn't really feel like downgrades where, you know, Nintendo's doing very well with the Nintendo Switch right now. But it does feel like some franchises are kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, Paper Mario, the Origami King. Well, you know, hey, you know, it's 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 fine. You know, uh, the Mario Sports title is like okay. Well, the gameplay's okay, but you know, the content's not there, and it just kind of feels like a lot of games like that. It just feels like it's cool that we're getting new entries, and these are quality enough. But on the GameCube, it didn't really feel like we were kind of making do with what we were getting at the time. It kind of feels like hey, this is like the best new version of this game from this beloved series. Um, and we got pretty much all the all the games from all the series. The only one that we kind of didn't really get was Kirby. Uh, and even then, we got Kirby Air Ride. Um, but, you know, no traditional game. But, hey, they, like, a couple were in development. Um, but they eventually yeah. just moved to Wii. Um, but overall, like, that's why it's, like, my favorite. I, I, I feel like it had, like, this great balance of, like, enough games to play. And this just kind of this communal feeling uh the wii u had not enough games to play at all kind of had a communal yeah. feeling like owning a wii u and just seeing everybody suffering with you um but the gamecube <laughs> at least had like all right all the games were great uh you had a decent amount of third-party support not a ton but still like enough to kind of at least keep you going um and the games nintendo was putting it were putting out were like second to none like some of the best maybe not like genre defining as, as like oh like mario sunshine was not as revolutionary or, or amazing as mario 64 was at the time but it was it was still a great entry in that series um and i i think that's potentially why uh the gamecube just didn't take off that much because like nintendo didn't really have that major game that was like wow this is revolutionary and everybody needs to see this metroid prime could have maybe could have been that but the metroid series would never like it's never like, oh my god, you know, everybody can play this, everybody enjoys this kind of thing. Um, so, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a shame that it didn't um, get the respect it deserved at the time, but uh, I feel like people are starting to, uh, starting to realize that now. And uh, it is unfortunate because that means uh, I am severely in debt <laughs> with how yeah. much I've been buying. <laughs> it was an interesting time in gaming. I, I think it was fun to see some of the the transitions they made made from the nintendo 64 to the gamecube especially with visuals and it was a big deal when the characters had fingers all of a sudden you know it's like wow this is incredible um but i i think for the most part it, it was a shame to look back on that gamecube because i feel like that's when nintendo was really as you say firing on all cylinders they had it i think more in tune with the I'm going to say that the hardcore Nintendo gamer, whereas the following generation, they went to the Wii and they kind of lost track of that a bit and went more mainstream with it. Um, but it worked for them. So that was at least good. And I, I'd like them to remember their legacy at the GameCube a bit more. Maybe, maybe not this generation with the Switch, but the following generation and add it into their subscription service and start pulling from that library of titles that younger gamers now can try out on their new system because it is hard to tell people to go get a gamecube and just start building up a library uh with where prices are so new ways for people to play these games i think would be the next best thing so here's hoping nintendo does that in the next five or ten years yeah for sure i mean like i'll, I'll at least extend it further i'm hopeful in the next 30 years <laughs> 